Hello and welcome to Our Voices. Millions of people each year are victims of human trafficking. Over 40 million are trafficked globally, hundreds of thousands of them here in the United States in what experts call one of the world's fastest growing criminal industries. January is the National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, where activists and officials work to bring more attention to the issue. But what are authorities and advocates doing to really stop this crime? And are there enough resources for survivors? Welcome to The Conversation. I'm Ayan Bior, here with my colleague, Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick. And we're joined once again by our Hausa Division colleague, Aisha Mwazu. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, Aisha. And to help us better understand this issue is Evelyn Chumbo. She is a trafficking survivor and activist. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So, Evelyn, this is an issue that you know all too well, both as a survivor and as an activist. Will you tell us your story? Yeah, sure. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. Again, you know, um, I like to introduce myself when I, you know, present. My name is Evelyn Chumbo. I'm a survivor activist. And uh, <laughs> so my story is a little bit long, so I try to make it short, you know, because we can be here all day. Um, originally from Cameroon, uh, originally from Cameroon, and for me, coming to the U.S., I don't know, uh, coming to the U.S., it was some. It was exciting for me. I was nine years old that um, that I was trafficked to the U.S. And while I was in Cameroon, I was fascinated by a lot of television shows. Like three of my favorite shows, you know, Bill Cosby. Don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I wanted to watch Mary Will Smith and Nine Hundred Two One Zero. I just thought that was how America was. Like it was the American Dream. Yes, yeah. that was the American Dream. That's what my vision of America was, you know. And uh, my parents were separated, so I was living with my uncle, you know, which was like a father to me. So when they say, hey, you're coming to America, I'm like, hey, yes, I don't care. I'm going to go be with Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so never once did I think that I would come to America and become a victim of modern day slavery. So what happened? How did you become a victim? Um, so again, so it was a false promise. I thought that I was coming to America to be, you know, kind of be adopted, like be a big sister to the kids that I was going to live with. You know, um, my trafficker was also from Cameroon, you know, and also from the tribe that I'm from. And I never really know much. Again, I was nine years old. I didn't know anything. And I arrived in the United States um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. And again, I first arrived in, in London which I thought that was America, you know, nevertheless, now I know the difference. <laughs> and, and so I was forced to take care of two kids, cook and clean, and never went to school from like age nine to 17. Wow. You know, I usually say, I, I say 17, but really there's also another th part of it. You know, I got placed into foster care at 17. And there I, w I was and I experienced another type of trafficking, which was sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I almost got recruited to that part, but I was like, okay, no, I just survived a domestic servitude. <laughs> I refuse to be selling my body for an old man just because of some Timberland boots, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, you know, so I, I escaped that, you know, I escaped living in a house, cooking and cleaning, no school. And my punishment was really, really brutal. You know, I have like scars here. Like I have to take off my clothes and get beat up. I slept on the floor. And if some of you know, as being from Africa, sometimes they feel like when you're dark skin, you're not beautiful. Yeah. So I was told a lot by my trafficker that I was ugly. So I wasn't, I wasn't fit to sleep on the bed. So I slept on the floor in America in a cold state. <laughs> you know, so when you think about the history of slavery, it's just like slavery was abolished in the U.S. in 1865. But yeah, I was again, I slept on the floor, taking care of two kids, cooking and cleaning at such a young age and no school. Mm -hmm. So, but when I got into foster care, I got my GED, I got my social degree, I got my bachelor, and I decided to be an activist. So if I may ask, what are you doing back home to ensure that girls who are trafficked are helped out and then ensure that others are not trafficked? You know, as an African, it's really hard a lot of the times for people to believe that Africans are still being sold into slavery. Mm -hmm. So in 2016, I had a young lady that was from Cameroon that contacted me um, through WhatsApp that she was trafficked from Cameroon to Kuwait. And she thought that she was going there to be a teacher. And then I came to find out there was a colleague of mine, um, Katie Ford, that has an organization called Freedom for All that also ran into that situation. And we partnered up, and she helped 
like 12 girls from Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon to go back to their country. Mm -hmm. And not also that I decided that, hey, because a lot of the times when we do get out of the situation and how, why do we get into the situation in the first place is because our parents cannot afford us going to school. We don't have the job and things like that. And we want to go to other countries to better our lives. Mm -hmm. So I came up with the idea when I spoke at a conference in 2014 that, hey, survivors are more than just their story. If you train us, give us a job, mm -hmm. we can do better. If you give us businesses or job, we can do better. Absolutely. So we, me and Katie, we went to Cameroon, and the 12 girls that were sent back to Cameroon were like, hey, won't you start a business here? You have some money, start a business, because instead of going to these countries and you be treated like a slave, mm -hmm. I know our country is not that great, we're still struggling, but having your own business, making your own money will be better. And, and so that's what I'm trying to do in Africa, and especially just to advocate for the young boys and girls that, hey, I know that our country is really, really bad. But no matter what, it's better. Because if you hear the stories that they, they tell them in Kuwait, they speed on them. They sleep on the floor, and they have to dress as Kuwaiti women. Not only do they have to work at home, but they also have to go sell their body at night. You know, now, now Evelyn, you know, was, we know this is a global problem that requires a global effort to combat it. Yeah. And as you mentioned here in the United States, people think it has just because slavery has <laughs> been abolished is, doesn't exist anymore, exactly. not realizing that it's only just gone underground. Yeah. Um, what You've been on the Presidential Advisory Council. Yeah. Is the United States doing enough to combat this problem that is happening both on its doorstep and elsewhere in the world? And what has been your advice to the US government about what it could and should do to combat trafficking and modern slavery? Thank you, that's a good question. So again, um, you know, trafficking is a big issue, not only in the United States, but in our own individual countries that we're from. But um, when I, I was nominated by the former president, um, Barack Obama, to serve on the White House Council for two years, and I was so impressed and so grateful because the U.S. actually realized that this is a big problem, and it took a step to say, you know, I remember the president saying that you cannot do this work without survival voices. Mm. Like, survival voices are the key to, mm. you know, in fighting this issue. So for him to nominate 11 of us, and very diverse, from different parts of the world, and U.S citizen to work on reports and write it. I just thought that was an amazing thing that the U.S. government did. And they want to learn about this. They, they have survivors to go out there to speak, to do training, to educate the world on this issue. But I know that the U.S. is really, they really fighting on this issue. And I'm so impressed, especially the survival leaders in, this, um, in, in the U.S. We are fighting a lot to come back. We work on reports. We do so much. But I also, I'm a little bit disappointed of the recent administration that took away housing for survivors of trafficking. And I just feel like they need to do more. And you cannot talk about trafficking without talking about immigration. Yes. Because yeah. again, I came here illegally. And I'm not a, a criminal. I went to school. I went. I did everything by law. So if you're talking about immigration, you have to talk about you know, you have to talk about human trafficking. And if you're talking about prevention, you have to focus on the most vulnerable exactly. people in society. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Course, exactly. Well, Ellen, you're giving us a lot to think about. <laughs> Stay right there because we're going to hear a lot more from you coming Thank up you. after the break. Well, as you just heard, human trafficking is a crime that capitalizes on the vulnerabilities of its victims, but survivors are fighting back, including some in Nigeria who are rebuilding their lives. That story when we return. <laughs> Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues. It's about listening to them. And bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories, and our voices will help shape the next generation. Welcome back here with Our Voices. We're joined by Sarah Bessel, Senior Staff Attorney at the Human Trafficking Legal Center here in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. So, Sarah, we just heard about uh, the, the fight on the activist front and what the, even the U.S. government is doing to try to end human trafficking. Can you talk to us a little more specifically about what uh, legal experts, including lawyers like yourself, are doing? Sure. 
So when you think about legal uh, approaches to anti-trafficking, you might think the traditional criminal justice approach, approach, so prosecuting traffickers for trafficking. But then I'm a civil lawyer, so I don't work in a criminal courtroom. And so there is a growing recognition that survivors uh, should be empowered to seek their own private right of action, so essentially suing their traffickers. So if you think O.J. Simpson was criminally acquitted, but then he was found guilty under the civil system. Mm. It's an easy way to understand it. And so we believe that in the power of justice and in providing survivors access to justice, uh, and not only um, civil accountability on the individual level for the individual perpetrators, but then there's a growing recognition that we need corporate accountability. Mm. Um, and so plenty of corporations, I'm sure as you've heard or are aware, are um, having their supply chains forced labor in the factories that supply the components or make the parts, et cetera. And so there's a growing recognition in a number of countries that corporations that are incorporated in their jurisdictions should, should be held accountable for forced labor in another country. I see. Can well, I just ask, is, yes. that, is that effective? Have you seen any sort of trends in whether um, holding corporations responsible mm -hmm. in this way, um, whether that's working? It, so it's very cutting edge. It's new um, and not to punt, but um, so we're we are optimistic that it will be successful. Yeah. So there's a, a French NGO by the name of Sherpa under the French due diligence laws that sued Samsung for false advertising, essentially, for saying that they had no forced labor or uh, no labor exploitation in their supply chain. It was revealed that they did, and they were successful in taking Samsung to court in France. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're very buoyed by those early successes. It's by no means easy, but we are hoping that that will be the future of corporate accountability. Thanks, Sarah. Nigeria's Agency for Combating Human Trafficking is repatriating and resettling women who have been subjected to forced labor and prostitution. Many were smuggled into Europe on false promises of working at well-paying jobs. Thousands of Nigerian women have been trafficked in recent years. Some were lucky enough to be able to return to their country. Timothy Obiezu takes a closer look at the story of some human trafficking victims who are now back in Nigeria rebuilding their lives. It was an offer Beatrice couldn't resist, a job the traffickers told her in 2013 on a big Italian farm. She took the bait, thinking she could help pull her father and mother out of poverty by working abroad. Instead, after being smuggled into Italy, she was forced into prostitution to earn money for her traffickers. So a friend of mine when he introduced me to tr said, ah, look at this place, you are going to work there in the farm did not tell me I'm going to do a prostitution. So at the end of the day, we passed through land, through Libya. So travel, we took a ship. A lot of people died. Beatrice was there for four years. More than 11,000 trafficked women from Nigeria are estimated to be working as sex slaves in Italy alone. Don't bring anything. It will pack a lot of people. They will beat you up, do uh, different things. They will give you fresh pepper. You know how it is if it got to your eyes, told you to put it in your vagina. How is this? Even if you are in your menses, you can still go outside and walk. Nigerian men are also victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Chukwemeka Asiebu spent six years in Libya and narrowly escaped alive. He returned to Nigeria and started an advocacy group for the rights of trafficked victims. As a human trafficker, you are meeting this, your own this. Is it detrimental to others? And actually, we found that human trafficking is quite detrimental. It's an epidemic. It's a disaster. Because you are meeting this on the expense of life of others. Nigeria's anti-human trafficking agency, NAPTIP, was set up in 2003 to address the problem. Over the years, it has made some progress repatriating and resettling victims back home, says Arinze Orakwe, a director at NAPTIP. Uh, it's a crime that uh, brought so much shame to Nigeria, and uh, it's a crime that uh, we're not proud to the record and the status of Nigeria, for which uh, government felt is important and critical that uh, we have to do something about it. With the help of NAPTIP, Beatrice is starting a new life after being trained in catering services. Now she's running her own business. Timothy Yubizu, VOA News, Abuja. 
So we just saw it was good news for Beatrice and a lot of the other victims that were profiled in that story. But that's mm -hmm. not the case for a lot of women around the world. They don't get to be repatriated back home. Mm -hmm. They a lot of times they don't have the same support that we saw um, in the in this video as well. Right. And I, you know, I always wonder about um, sort of the the definitions and the meanings around the word and the language we use. If it is such an important issue, we also need to do better in in our language. Um, so to make sure that everybody understands what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands when a crime is being committed mm -hmm. and that often is hard in many um, places that we're from. I'm from South Africa where a uh, transit point destination yeah. um, you know this is uh, I, I often think trafficking sometimes just means the movement of people mm -hmm. at least that's how it sounds to me sometimes and people often think prostitution yeah. um, sex trafficking is the definition clear to everyone so it's it's clear on paper, but in terms of the public awareness of what trafficking is, it's not clear. So the definition is it's, it's the exploitation of others for forced labor or services exactly. or sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. But there is a myth that it requires movement mm -hmm. across borders. And yes, that definitely happens, but you can have internal uh, trafficking. If you look to India, there's a huge problem with internal migration, and those are trafficking yeah. victims. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, you know, using the language of slavery can create in the public a and a thought that it requires false imprisonment, imprisonment that it requires mm. shackles. Mm. When, it, you know, as Evelyn said earlier, it's a hidden crime, but sometimes yeah. they're hidden in plain sight. And so you have a domestic worker who is allowed outside of the house mm -hmm. to get the groceries, take the children to school. You have forced labor victims who are forced to work in factories in Southeast Asia who can go to and from their dorms or their barracks to the factory. Uh, and so I think it is a continuing effort to educate the public about what trafficking actually is and what a trafficking victim looks like. And it's not just a young Eastern European woman yeah. who is trafficked to Europe yeah. for sex. Because many people exactly. are trafficked uh, yeah. in, enslaved at home. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. And, and I think it's especially important mm -hmm. to let the diaspora mm -hmm. communities know what yes. human trafficking looks like yeah. and what mm -hmm. it is ex exactly. Because we've had conversations yeah. that our communities, mm -hmm. our diaspora mm -hmm. communities, look at victims as if they're the perpetrators. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, you know, Sarah mentioned, that's a good definition. But to me, again, it's always overlooked. Like, when people automatically think human trafficking, they automatically think sex. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, they think there's a folks from Asia, you know, and India. Never, people don't think that, you know, Africans can be victims. Right. You know, or Afri Africans are so into sex, you know. Uh, uh, they're out there doing, you know, having sex trafficking, sex, sex trade. And a lot of times, like I said, the definition is different. For me, to me, living that experience, I think it's a form of modern day slavery, yeah. you know, because again, at times people take money for right. folks. And not long ago, it was in Libya. Yeah. Africans were being yeah, auctioned Saudi, off. I was in Saudi last year. Exactly. And, and I was at the consulate. Yeah. And I met a, a bunch of ladies there. Exactly. And the consul general explained to me why they are there. They were there. They were trafficked, yeah. you know, on fake promises yeah. of jobs, well-paying jobs. Yeah. But they ended up being slaves Slaved there. Slaves yeah. Uh, so much more that when you want to encourage these women not to, yeah. you know, because when they gave me a scenario, because... They have agencies back home in Nigeria. Exactly. That they have syndicates in Nigeria and then in Saudi. In Saudi. Yeah. For Saudi, they have offices, physical offices where you yeah. can go to, but in Nigeria, they are faceless. Yeah. You can't talk to them on phone, but yeah. you can't trace them. Yeah. And you try to discourage just women. No, no. It's like you are. You're and it's like, it's like future. you're lying. Again, it's a big business. Like, and also, it's also lack of education. Like, I can speak from my experience. Like, my uncle that you know, made the arrangement, took money. But again, that was like a father. He said he didn't know, he didn't understand. And I truly believe that maybe he did not understand. He thought that the money was a gift and he thought that he was sending me, you know, to get a better future. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I'm his daughter. Yes, he's my uncle, but to me, that was my father. But again, I had to explain to him like, sorry, uncle, you, that, that money that you took, you sold me because I remember my trafficker particularly said, I pay so much much money for you and you and, felt guilty and i felt guilty mm -hmm. and the trauma part of me is like but no my uncle could not do that that's my uncle that's my father so when i travel home that was the because it really affected me so bad that i had to ask my uncle did you he's like yeah i took the money but he thought it was a gift but so have again, you had instances where girls also were sold off or 
sent uh, trafficked by their relatives or loved yeah, ones? Yeah, we have a mm -hmm. lot of instances, you know, like that. You knowingly. know, a lot, yeah, knowingly, you know. Familial trafficking Sorry. is a large problem, and that's the other side of the coin. Um, uh, misnomers about what trafficking is, but yeah. also misconceptions about who traffickers are. Exactly. And oftentimes it's family members exactly. or friends or community exactly. members. Exactly. And so that's why it can be hard to prosecute when and you that's ask how about it makes it easier, right? Much easier. For people to fall victim because the trust yes. factor is already exactly. there exactly. when you're trusting. <laughs> In the United States, we often hear the term if you see something, say, say something. something. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder in places, um, in the developing world, in the countries that you know we come from, it, it's harder to to know what you're seeing and also know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, in South Africa, women don't even report rape, right. mm -hmm. um, their own um, attack that, that they've been when they've been attacked. Uh, for someone to to go to the police, I mean, that's almost uh, you just say to yourself, "I'm not even going right. to bother." So, what, what's the recourse that people have? Um, and my other question is, this seems like a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. Are they, is it better to look at systemic solutions and what are those systemic solutions that can make all of us feel like we can be part of the solution? Uh, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I think you've hit on a, on, a, on a great point is that, you know, law enforcement around the world are not trained on this, are not yeah. trained how to identify it. Mm -hmm. And so if you go, and then they also think trafficking is just sex trafficking. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you go to them about a domestic servitude case, they probably won't be able to help you. But there is a vibrant civil society culture around this. And most countries will have nonprofit organizations that you can call and you can report to who are doing excellent work on repatriation and resettlement and assisting victims. Um, so I would say for those who are out there uh, of your viewers who are wondering where to go, do your research and look in your community about yeah. for those organizations that are working on gender, on violence against women, on anti-trafficking, and reach out to them and say, who do I call if if I see something and what can I do? Yeah. And these days there's an app for that, uh, apparently. Yeah. I'm there seeing is. organizations coming out with actual oh, yeah. apps that really empower yeah. people um, with mobile technology. Yeah. And I mean, like Sarah said, and it's just amazing when I think about what the U.S. really has done. It's like having survivors like us going to train law enforcement, train, training, you know, NGOs, even themselves, because sometimes you can have folks that do work in NGO but just don't know how to assist a victim. You know, so survivor leaders like us, you know, we've been doing that. We've been giving that training. And in some part, you know, in Africa, you have a lot of countries that are doing that, that I know of. Like, I know I have a colleague in Ghana that, you know, is doing amazing work, you know, doing some training and stuff like that. But I pray that Africa will get to a point where we can train the government just yeah. like we do here. That's key. That's <laughs> exactly. Key. That is the key. Just yeah. like we do here in the U.S. But I just feel like most government in, you know, Africa usually blame the victims right. without understanding the solution, right. you know. So and a cultural change. Exactly. That exactly. Like so we've come change. such a long way. Right. Like we have a, a right. call number. I wish we could have that, that. In, right, in, right. in Africa. Well, it's you good know. to know that there are apps to fight human trafficking, <laughs> but there are all also people and we're going to meet two women who are doing just that fighting human trafficking right after the break stay tuned this is a country that i chose to become a citizen i didn't have to become a citizen i chose to become a citizen i feel like america gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor, and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. Welcome back. Every day, millions of women, men and children are trafficked around the world. But there are also fearless people working to combat the problem and who are helping to free victims. This week, we highlight two women working to fight human trafficking and modern slavery. 
That's right. And one of those women is Anita Nyanjong. She works for victims at the global organization Equality Now and is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a member of the Federation of Women Lawyers of Kenya. So she's not just using her voice to create change. She's also using the laws in Kenya to make sure that women have access to justice. And Evelyn, she reminds me of a woman that you are also watching. Yes. So we also have um, Bokola Olorolo that she is a survivor from Nigeria and she was a journalist in Nigeria and she's doing amazing work. She's on the White House Advisory Council. And not only did she use her voice, she's also created, you know, create like little um, survival made products and, you know, she sells it and things like that. And she teach other survivors how they can use their voice to, you know, through stories. She writes books and she, she is doing an amazing job. And, and she's also from Cameroon? No, she's from Nigeria, Yoruba. And not only that, we also have uh, another survivor, Francesca Awa, that mm -hmm. Last year, she won the Tip Office Hero Award, and she is a survivor that was trafficked from Cameroon to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And she recently was presenting at the Obama Foundation in Chicago. And that's another woman to watch out for that. I just feel like they're doing amazing work, mm -hmm. you know, in the continent and here in the U.S. That's great. And that's our show for today. Our thanks to Aisha Mwazu from the House of Service, as well as survivor activist Evelyn Chumbo and Sarah Bessel with the Human Trafficking Legal Center. Ladies, it was a pleasure having you today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for watching. Head to voanews.com for more episodes of Our Voices. And on behalf of the Voice of America and along with our colleagues, thanks for watching. Good day.